Welcome to the Driving Change Podcast on the Evergreen Podcast Network, where we live at the intersection of neuroscience and storytelling. If you love great stories and you love understanding the mindset it takes to be a world-class change agent, then join us as our fascinating guests from all walks of life unpack their unique journeys of perseverance and passion, of expertise and experience, and be inspired to use your own story to drive change. Welcome back to the Driving Change Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Bloomfield. Uh, Today's guest, boy, you're going to have some fun with this gentleman because this gentleman probably knows more about your childhood than you do because uh, Gene Columbus was one of the instrumental catalysts to some of the best performances you've probably ever seen live if you've ever gone to Disney. And I will tell you that Gene has been, I mean, he is he is on the Mount Rushmore of production when it comes to people that have made a huge impact on many of our childhoods without us even really realizing it. And, and Gene began uh, with a 10-year career performing in the motion picture business, television, live stage. But I think, as you'll see through his story, he was always destined to be at Disney, and he ended up. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna learn that story as he ended up at Disney, where he worked his way up from you know bringing coffee and donuts to Walt. I'm just kidding, um, all the way to where he was like just the the guy. He filled in the swamp in Orlando, folks. He he literally helped build Walt Disney World in Orlando when it started, and he is he's really well known for um, his ability to lead, develop coach, think critically, put teams together, think about lots of complex things and moving parts and pieces and how it all comes together into into magic. And I think the magic doesn't just apply to a stage production. It's going to apply to your personal lives and to your families, to the businesses that you're at. And he's got just a wealth of wisdom and knowledge that he's going to drop on us today. Gene, it's it's an honor to have you on the Driving Change Podcast. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Jeff. It's so nice to be here. My goodness, uh, uh, all of the nice things to say. When, and now I'm at a point in my life where I get a chance to to look back. And it's uh, one of the things I like to share with, with people is success is not measured by where you are, but by how far you have come. Mm. But uh, I'd like to go back because I, you know, I want to lace this through with honoring my father and my mother. That's right. We got to start with your origin story. Let's take us back, Gene. Take us all the way back. It's only recently that I have been talking about the issues of my very, very early life. Uh, I was born just before World War II. My father at the time was working in the steel mills in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. World War II broke out. He, He had gone through the Depression. My parents had gone there. They got married young and I was the second child, and my father in the steel mills is immediately drafted and is part of the uh, industrial part of supporting the war. They didn't use much in the way of, uh, of, of um, air quality. That was secondary. As a result, my older sister, Chris, and my mother contracted tuberculosis. So uh, this was this was difficult, but m- my mother couldn't leave because she had me and another child on the way. My sister was sent off to uh, to get uh, treatment. However, at the end of the war, it was dis- they, it was absolutely critical that we get my mother out of that polluted environment. So we went to Colorado, to Mile High City. And clean, fresh air. And <clears throat> when I <clears throat> when I th- think about that, my father, who was career military, always felt a little guilty that he was homeside in the steel mills. And just uh, Memorial Day, we we think about his cousins and and a brother that died at Normandy, and that always made him feel guilty that he should have been there. But I kept telling him, "This is your effort." is equally as important. And we tell that to people. There is no such thing as an unimportant person. And if, and if we, we talk about a show at any given moment, each individual becomes the most important in a war effort. Each person becomes the most important in a show. The person that pulls the curtain to open it up and then the most important person is the lighting technician that turns on the light so you can see it and the audio person. So each of us 
contribute. And in life, as we move through, we become important. Maybe we're a bit player, a supporting role, or the star. But any given time, we and those around us become the most important. Well, in any event, uh, <clears throat> my mother ended up, when we went to uh, Denver, ended up in a sanitarium, a National Jewish Hospital, which was the center for respiratory illnesses in, in the 1940s and continues to this day. Uh, but there's four children now. So uh, home was St. Clara's Orphanage, which was, uh, at least I had my parents, even though my mother was in a sanitarium. And occasionally my father would come and pick us up and take us so my mother could see us out the window of the hospital because she wasn't permitted to be near us because of tuberculosis. Um, in the 1940s, it was not unusual f for kids to get sick. I got sick. I went to the, and they diagnosed polio. And I, I, I did not, I just was felt sick. I did not know what that meant. Well, they went through, measured me, did all kinds of stuff. And then they, they said I had to wear braces. But it meant I couldn't. Uh, at the orphanage, people would come in and they could do uh, Mr. Bernard wonderful old man would come in and play George M. Cohen and teach us all of the, the patriotic songs. And it was wonderful. And a dance teacher would come in and teach tap dancing, but I was not allowed to do that. But that resonated with me. That looked like so much fun. So uh, moving forward, I uh, my sister takes uh, starts taking dance lessons and I'm supposed to be doing physical therapy. And here I am, 13, 14 years old. And, uh, man, I just, uh, I was supposed to go in and get fitted for a bigger brace. And I, 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 I was trying to do all I could to avoid that. And they said, well, if you'll do your physical therapy, maybe we can do it without the brace. And, uh, um, and my, my sister was with me and she said, well, he could take dance lessons and the doctors all oh, that would be great. Well, uh, <clears throat> I refused until my sister made friends with undoubtedly the most beautiful girl in the whole wide world, Barbara Lodge. Isn't that name beautiful? Barbara was 16. I'm 14. And now when you're 14, you don't talk to girls. You just look at them. And, and, and she would come over to the house and she would sit and watch television with my, my sister. And I would pretend to do homework and I would look at Barbara. Well, <laughs> well, my sister calls me one day. I'm home uh, and, and she said she forgot her dance uh, shoes. And when I, when I bring them down to the dance studio and realized when I was 14, I wouldn't walk across the room to help my sister. <laughs> but the prospects of seeing Barbara Lodge, Barbara Lodge in leotards and tights <laughs> was more than the 14 year old could resist. <laughs> So I got on my bicycle, practiced peripheral vision, went down to the dance school. And as I walked in, Betty Floyd, the dance teacher, went, oh, he would be just perfect. And I started to protest, but everything went into slow motion to dance with Barbara Lodge. <laughs> <So> <laughs> she, was, she was mortified. She's dancing with her best friend's little brother. But... She was always sweet to me, and, and so we did performances, and, and uh, finally the dance teacher says, you're both going to have to do a solo, and I said, no, I don't do solos. I dance with Barbara, and they, uh, Betty Floyd would not take no for an answer, and um, I was sure that they were going to bring over ripe vegetables to throw at me, but, but I did this thing, and I was also, uh, in addition, I loved all the physical activities of, 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 of gymnastics and things. Uh, uh, I certainly, my muscles were really tight and hard, but I pushed and pushed and pushed. Well, at that performance uh, was uh, Francesca and Dmitri Rumanoff from American Ballet Theater. And uh, Betty Floyd gets me and said, there's some people that would like to meet you. And they offered me a scholarship to the Ballet Theater School. Well, I took it, it was free. And that started my journey. But I, I learned something important and I, I share with people. Again, it's uh, about being a member of a team. I saw this because I was always being left out, being in the chorus, being the same as everyone else was powerful to me. But also 
There's no I, my, or me in chorus, but there is an us. And we looked good. So I loved being in the chorus. And I kept getting more and more involved in it. And musical theater, oh my goodness, I fell in love with musical theater. And then it, the decision is, will I go to New York and pursue the ballet? Uh, but I, I opted to go to Hollywood because I... I wanted to be in movies. Oh my goodness, I love watching Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire. I thought, this is what I want to do. Even one of those guys in the background. And uh, indeed I went and uh, that started this uh, wonderful 10 year performing career in Hollywood, working in motion pictures. And as you say, you know, but I loved, I loved being live on stage, the musical theater. But I also had this incredible ballet training uh, and, and in fact, uh, when George Balanchine was starting the Ballet of Los Angeles, I was one of the first guys that he selected. So I'm, I was really well trained as a classical dancer, which proved very valuable when I was doing television shows. And they needed a partner. So uh, some choreographers knew of that background, and they knew if they could, if I had to partner, you know, I could, I could lift. I could uh, work with uh, ladies. So uh, that was an absolutely wonderful phase of my career. And I got to work in motion pictures like the movie A Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand. Uh, I did uh, Dr. Doolittle, the one with Rex Harrison. Uh, uh, not to be missed, Clam Bake with Elvis Presley. Uh, and, and those pictures are treasures for me now and it just just a glorious time uh, but then I made the pronouncement by the age of 30 I would no longer accept being a member of the chorus I had to move on and that's when I segued into being a stage manager all right so let's pause because <clears throat> I have questions <laughs> <laughs> question question number one and the audience is thinking this so I'm going to ask it what the heck happened to Barbara I was out of the country when Betty Floyd passed away. And at the memorial service, my sister ratted on me and said, oh, Jean talks about you. And, and she describes that. And oh, Barbara was just thought that was wonderful. And then my sister said, you know, he would love to get together with, with you and, and, and catch up and all of that. And, uh, and the next day, Barbara calls my sister and says, uh, by the way, she got married to somebody whose last name was Gunner, uh, and she had four children. Uh, she, she said, uh, I've been thinking about it, and I would rather not see Gene because I want him to remember me the way I was wow. back then and not change his image of me. And I, I thought about how unselfish that was of her to think about this, you know, this 13, 14 year old kid that, that had a crush on her and she did not want to in any way disturb that image. The lesson I hear there in there is that, you know, the tale is old as time. Boy chases girl, boy does crazy things for girl. Uh, boy doesn't always catch girl, but boy in the process of chasing girls sometimes learns how to chase a dream. Yes. And that's what happened to you. As a result, so it's okay to, it's okay, fellas out there when you're young and, and you're thinking about this and you're wound up and maybe you don't even know the motive, the, the, the real motive behind it. There's a purpose working behind the scenes, right? I love, uh, you know, I love that, that story because it was somehow people and situations come into your life and they, 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 they nudge you in a new direction. And, but I feel they kind of uh, allow you the magnet in you, it there's something that attracts. So you, you're drawn to it. And that was where I was drawn to the performing arts. I, I loved the ballet because it, the, the music, the discipline, the, the unity, the, 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 the work to just, just make it the most beautiful thing you could. So you were drawn to performance at a young age. Um, Barbara became a catalyst, right? Sometimes we all need a catalyst in our life to kind of 
pull that magnet in and point us in a different path, which is, which is awesome. I think as we, the audience, if you're listening, you're listening, you're thinking back, like, in I love your opening comment about we don't measure success based on where we are, but how far we've come. But we don't also stop at where we are. We look for what's the next catalyst. So as people are thinking about these people in your lives right now, someone in your life, if you're listening, they're probably there for a reason. They're probably there for a catalyst for what's next for part of your passion. Now, another question I have, I have two other follow-ups and we're going to move into some of your, your, your work as you went into Disney, but so polio is not really well known today. Obviously it's mostly it's eradicated today, but so when people hear that they think, well, how did you overcome that? Like what, what happened health wise that get, allowed you to, did you overcome that with physical therapy and just a healthy immune system? Like what, what happened that allowed you to overcome that? I, I had to go through the physical therapy and, um, uh, it was boring. It was tedious and, I would do it and they would, I was kind of, well, because it was happening initially in, at the orphanage and, the, and it was a Catholic orphanage. So the nuns were, uh, <clears throat> you know, taskmasters do this and count. And so I would, I would do that. I don't know that I did it with great energy or enthusiasm, but I did it because then it was, I was required to do it. But when I went into dance, I could push myself physically and, and, uh, and, and I, uh, I had already, because of physical therapy, I think I became more aware of my of my body, my where I was, and so I <clears throat> I tended to do the more acrobatic things. I loved to jump, I loved to turn, and surprisingly was 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 really strong upper body, and and that really uh, helped. But I'll tell you, when I was wearing the brace, particularly in the orphanage, I was a target. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> uh, it was great fun because I would be walking down the, the hall and a kid could hit me just right and I would spin and I was like a turtle. I'd fall and I couldn't get up. And 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 why I resented wearing the brace was uh, because I, when I was down there, they would laugh at me. And, and I was uh, incredibly sensitive to that. And... Uh, and I will admit that um, my feelings were hurt and I cried. And then I was called the crybaby, which was even worse. And so uh, to protect me, my, my, uh, we had to do chores. My chores were somewhat isolated and they put me in the chapel uh, to more, I think, probably protect me at that point. But I think I, I learned about what it feels like when someone's unkind and uncaring. You learned that, but also it sounds like performing and dance for you was the antithesis of how you felt when you were in the braces. It was almost like you, you would, it's, it wasn't, yeah, it, was, it wasn't just that you'd overcome polio and were just walking around like a normal person. You, you overcame it with great pizzazz, right? You're like, you're like showing the world that this isn't, this isn't just about braces and polio and being picked on as a kid. You went the full opposite end of the spectrum and became this strong viral performer who could lift ballerinas and use your body that was the that was your that was your kryptonite as a young boy now it's your superpower <laughs> I, would, I never thought of it that way but, but yeah it, it was it was uh, but it led me and connected me with so many many opportunities I, 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 uh, I have to tell you that that you know in my in my very early days, I will tell you when I got to Hollywood, and I needed to share this story, and so many people asked me about, about this, you know, and it is getting into the film work. When I got out to Hollywood, I was, I was able to get concert work. I was, I will say I was experienced and trained well enough that I would, I could be a, a guest artist with orchestras, and I would go out and I'd do the Swan Lake Pas de Deux or, or Les Sylphides, or, so, so, you know, that was a very nice way to use the training that I had. But the one thing I wanted when I went out there was to Hollywood was to be in movies. But there's a catch 22. You cannot even audition for a motion picture unless you belong to the union, but you could not join the union until you had a motion picture. And uh, I will tell you my journey there was uh, I was very disappointed that I, I, I was doing network television, I was doing local television, I was doing equity, uh, professional musical theater, 
And uh, but I really wanted to do movies. I was uh, all, all friends were working on, on on Mary Poppins, and and I couldn't even go in an audition. It was just, just frustrating. So uh, I heard about an audition at Walt Disney Productions for Babes in Toyland. I snuck in. Boy, did that take for me to cross that line. <laughs> well, the audition by Tommy Mahoney, the choreographer, was um, was basically ballet. And here I, you know, I've done all these male variations, uh, you know, Swan Lake, uh, uh, Nutcracker. So, so uh, they give a rather simple combination. Do I follow instructions? Oh, no. Mr. Showoff, I proceed to do... Uh, uh, you know, many pirouettes and in the air and ends dramatically on the floor. And Tommy Mahoney said, you go stand over there. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I blew it. I didn't do what I was told to do. And so they're, and, and so they kept dividing the guys into two lines until uh, everybody had a chance. Then he turned to the other line and says, thank you, gentlemen. In show business, when they say thank you, that means no thank you. We're not interested. Well, you're out of here. So thank you is is a kind of not not something you want to hear. Right. My line, guys, rehearsals start next week. I got it. I got my first motion picture, and then they, then then they 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 had a clipboard, and you you had to fill out all this stuff, and 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 wardrobe people measured you, and they took all this stuff, and but there was this thing about. Uh, uh, union affiliation, and I was in all of the unions except the Screen Actors Guild or the Screen Extras Guild. So, uh, but it turned out, Tommy, I was the first guy he selected. Well, I get all the information. I go home and I call my parents to tell them. I got an out. I will say my parents were not necessarily enamored with my choice of careers, show business, and. And, and, and initially, just trying to even get started was a challenge. Well, we had this somewhat euphoric conversation about at last, and there's a lot of movies coming up, and this means lots of possible work. And so I'm on this euphoric high, and the phone rings, and the voice at the other end identifies himself as Dick Ivey's from uh, Disney Casting. Gene, the union is challenging you being on the film. You're not a member, and you weren't even authorized to attend the audition. Our hands are tied. We have to drop you from the call. Oh. Mm. Devastation. The call to my parents to tell them it was all a mistake? That was, that was tough. I was, um, I was really then asking myself, is this... Is this the life I want? Is this what I'm meant to do? I don't think I left my apartment for three days. And then uh, I got a call and it, it's Dick Ivey's. And Dick says, uh, Gene, we feel terrible about what happened with this audition. And uh, you obviously have the training and the skills necessary to do this work. But, but look, we're doing another film. It's called The Misadventures of Merlin Jones. And we need a, a stand-in for Tommy Kurt, would you be willing to do it? And I said, well, what do I do? He says, you, you just stand there, but it'll get you in the union. Yes, I'll do it. And I ran down and I joined the union before anybody could change their mind. But each morning I had to show up really early and the, the camera would be, I would stand in a, on a mark and they would focus the camera and lights on me, big click lights. Uh, he didn't tell me that you sweat a lot, uh, but under those really hot lights. Well, those first couple days, I'm, I'm, I'm new. I have no, I know no soul on the, and, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Well, they, uh, once everything is set, uh, out of nowhere, somebody screams, save it, guys, and all the lights go out, and everybody would make a beeline for coffee. I was not important, so I waited till everybody else got their coffee. I got my coffee, and I I would go try to stand next to just just just. I, certainly, I'm far more gregarious now than I am there, but I was in a totally foreign land, and so I I get my coffee and I step to the side to put. 
cream and sugar, the guy that got in line behind me, looks at me, puts his cup down and says, hello, I'm Walt Disney. Oh, my gosh. He starts asking me questions about where I was from and what I was doing. To this day, I have no idea what I said. I, I, I think I called him Mr. Disney, and he, he says, no, no, call me Walt. That was a line very difficult for me to cross over. But, but why was it so important to me? The fact that the man whose name was on the gate that I entered that morning did not presume I knew who he was. And he wanted to know about me, the most unimportant person on that soundstage. And when I share this story and I ask your viewers this, how do you make people feel? How do you make people feel? My lesson was Walt Disney made me feel important. From his high position, taking a few moments just to talk to this kid. I was determined at that point to work with an organization that was willing to help some kid get their start and also show respect, consideration, some form of, of importance. Wow, so there's another catalyst, right? So now you have this catalytic moment with Walt himself. Pretty amazing. That basically projects you into this career at Disney, uh, which you had several iterations of, of, what was that like just now, you, you kind of, in many ways, grew up there at that point, right? You really grew well, up. This was, uh, I still had a, a, a few more years uh, performing because then I did some motion pictures after that. I was, I was following through on that. Uh, but I also put it, you know, by the time I'm 30, I, I can't be in the course. I need to be moving on. Uh, but uh, along that uh, journey, uh, I was doing a television show and I got uh, seriously injured with a fall. And I couldn't work. And so I took time and I went back to school, which was the best. I mean, I, uh, I couldn't work, couldn't do anything. So I'm, I'm going to school and it was I'm joyful. I love, I love that, that environment and all, uh, which helped because then when I did work my way back, you know, the, I liked looking at contract. I liked all that. So I was always kind of, well, in actor's equity, there was a deputy and I would be the equity deputy. And uh, <coughs> I got to know the management because I'd, I'd go and they, they said, you know, you're a pretty reasonable fellow. And I'm doing a large production at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles. And they said, well, would you be willing to be a performing assistant stage manager? What do I got to do? Keep actors and singers from walking into moving scenery. Oh, I, I could do that. So they gave me a few extra dollars in my paycheck and a flashlight. Oh. <laughs> I must have been good with the flashlight because they didn't cast me in the next show, but they offered me the position of assistant stage manager. So I did that for a while, and then I got a call from, the, from Walt Disney Productions to join the national international touring show of Disney on Parade. Valentine's Day, 1970. This huge arena show to tour the United States that ultimately would be touring Canada, Mexico, then the foreign tours in Australia, New, Ze New Zealand, uh, South America. Uh, there's a London company and, and uh, uh, South Africa. And <clears throat> I started out as the ballet master because they, they felt that the, 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 because it was so dance heavy that the, they needed to <clears throat> provide the dancers with with warm up, and also uh, <clears throat> initially they hired uh, people that were more parade type performers, like what they used at Disneyland. But then once the choreographers, they wanted them to do a whole lot more. So it was to try to improve their skill levels. But so I was, I was the ballet master, the assistant stage manager because I had been doing that, and they needed another assistant stage manager, and that meant that uh, it, it was just not a new head count. But then to really add to it, they said they wanted me to be Cinderella's prince. And so um, those are the pictures that are sweet. Uh, I have some lovely pictures with Miss Becky, my wife. Uh, <coughs> we got married in 1970 as well. So uh, 
Miss Becky got her prince, and I got the prettiest girl in the whole corps. So, so she literally got to marry Prince Charming. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was uh, it was lovely. Uh, but but we had met earlier in musical theater. We were do- both doing a production of uh, Hello Dolly. She was this really cute girl. Oh, and we know we all know your affinity for cute girls. We've been down that road. So we- <laughs> I am influenced greatly. Uh, uh, Miss Becky was, and Miss Becky loves me to tell the story of Barbara Lodge. Becky, uh, <clears throat> Becky became the the fulfillment of Barbara, right? As uh, as as your as your princess. Absolutely. So uh, so we don't want, I don't want us to run out of time on this because I want to get to the parts where now, as your career evolved and you got into more, you got you went from less performer and more leader, coach, and you became a you know more of the coordinator and the coach of others. And, and at some point that transition and you you just took to that like a duck to water also. It seemed like based on what I've seen from your career, you were kind of like the magnet drew you to performing at a young age. Now kind of as you as you evolved in your career, it looked like the magnet drew you to being a great coach and mentor as well. What was that like at Disney and what were some of the things you learned in that process? I would say it was uh there's two aspects of it. One aspect was that learning dance, I had to work extra hard and I analyzed the best way. And, and so I started teaching classes. And that, that, so I could, I was, I had a, apparently a good eye to help people get better as a coach and, and using various ways to encourage and, and support and get them. So that, that was one part of it. There was another part. I would go to the audition and uh, as I said, you know, thank you is no thank you. But you could be standing there and, and the casting people would, would have conversations about you and, and, and you can hear them. It's, it's, you're just not a, you're just not in a meat market. It, 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 they would talk about you. And, and at times, rude and uh, just not say kind things. And I promised myself that I would never humiliate people in that fashion. So when, when I, as I advanced, even on Disney on Parade, I, I started out as assistant, then I became the stage manager, production stage manager, company manager, project uh, coordinator, then uh, the, the uh, uh, associate producer. That was over seven years. Then I went to Walt Disney World with this incredible wealth of information and managing around the world, managing Australians, managing South Americans, Brazilians, Argentinians, uh, Colombians, uh, Americans, French, and all, and, and then South Africa, and, and working with different cultures. And, but there, there's a human quality. People reflect your attitude. If you're mean, mad, and ugly to them, and then you get upset with them because they're mean, mad, and ugly back to you, well, think about it. However, I learned to listen. And I'll just pause for a moment to tell you, in my role as a stage manager, the uh, technology in the 1970s uh, literally blew out my ears. And so uh, when, I, when I transitioned to, to uh, being manager of shows and uh, Magic Kingdom Entertainment, of course, there was only a Magic Kingdom there and some resort. It was... It, it was managing those people that were managing our people. So when we talk about, and earlier on before our, we started recording, we talked about the priorities of our decision-making that, that, that like you and your college program, you learned first, foremost, always number one is our guest. The quality of their experience is our second highest priority. Our third priority was the people out there, the team members that, that, that have to provide the support to make it the best. And then making sure that you're, you're doing it in a, with good basic business principles of, of taking care of business, being, having a, a process uh, <clears throat> that, that doesn't become more important than, your, than your, your, your guests. However, when you go into the leadership role, your primary number one is you take care of the people that are taking care of the guests. And, 
and and uh, I found that people respond more to being um, encouraged and given given permission, if you will, to uh, to be kind. And and you know, our, our, when I was when I was there, our classic Disney training surprise and delight find ways to surprise and delight so when when we talk about the transition into the leadership and leadership roles it came with promising myself to be kind to people even if you can't cast them even though i cast people uh, early on when i was at walt disney world before i i, I, w- I went deaf um I would cast people in shows, uh, but then I also began seeking and finding tomorrow's leaders. And right now, Jeff, I'm gonna just look beyond you because people watching tomorrow's leaders, what are you doing to develop leadership skills? Well, I'm just, I'm gonna do anything. I, I. Uh, uh, I speak uh, to groups a lot about what does a leader look like? What are the qualities of, of not good, but great, great leaderships? And, and the other part is what leads the leader? What are your core values? What, what is it that, that is then that, that burn in you, that, that you're passionate about, that, that, that your ethical standards are they're continuously being pushed more and more? Leaders, uh, what do leaders do the right things, and a manager does it right. So, doing the right thing, and I, I think if if you would ask what is Gene's legacy, uh, most people would say it was the at Walt Disney World, it was in the staffing, finding, leading training, developing, supporting young leaders, people with potential. I hired people with potential that had these, that had these qualities of, of wanting to do things right and take care of their people. And now those people are in senior positions at Disney. And what's really strange for me now is that Many of those people that I hired all those years ago are inviting me to their retirement parties. You've been around a while, Gene. It's an exciting part, but there is this another generation of uh, uh, when I was an adjunct professor at the University of Central Florida. I, uh, I, I exposed those students who would come to, to UCF because they had strong interest in the theme park industry with, with Disney and Universal and SeaWorld and Busch Gardens and probably also the, the uh, convention area. So they were coming here to be in close proximity. And so I spent a portion of the, not only teaching traditional stage management for the stage, I taught what it's like to be in entertainment, in, in theme park stage management, supervising supervising people that, career people, musicians, these, these uh, you, you look at the training of, of these performers, many of them have degrees and advanced degrees in, in musical theater. You look at technicians, these technicians, they have degrees in, in, in uh, design. So being able to help and support them realizing their dreams is so important. So let's end with this then. I want to I want to point people to where they can learn more about you and your books and everything. But before we do, I have one last question um, that I think I love your perspective on it because you're really good and gifted at this. And it is about the question. I know one of the things you have a passion for is helping young people, um, especially young people, uh, learn how to ask the right questions uh, as opposed to necessarily having the right answers. Uh, what advice would you give any of us of, of any age, but particularly for young people coming up around that idea of how do they learn to develop that skill of asking the right question? It's the story uh, at a, when I was just talking to a group of, of design students and they would uh, show me their stuff and they'd say, see, I did this and this and this and this. And I said, that's good. So uh, what would you like from me? Well, I just want you to tell me if you think it's good or not. And I said, I still don't know. Can you tell me 
the story, to formulate your questions, you, you're going to start, this is what I've done in the past that brings me to where I am today. And now I'm seeking to na- take the next step. Obviously, there's many, many steps I could take in different directions. Placing the question to the interviewer, well, what should I do, puts them in an awkward spot. Because what I would encourage them, I was saying, what do you want to do? If you didn't have to worry about student loans and all that other stuff. And if you had to focus on doing something, what would it be? And then tell me how I can help you. Uh, I, I had uh, I had one little girl just 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 start tearing up because she showed me her design, and uh, I said it's really pretty. But what is it about? I says if let's take take us on a journey. When you're telling me about it, it is is uh, since I was a child, I've been drawn to, and I've I continue to to explore, and I came to this, and I made a detour, and I discovered all of these other things, and I know there's more things out there. Am I doing the right thing? Of course you are. Of course you are. You can't, uh, you can't ask someone to answer the question that only you and your heart can answer, but it's okay not to know, but it's not okay not to try. For the many of the, the young people, it's, look, I'm keeping all my options open and I'm looking for all the possibilities. And uh, when I find them, I, I will say for me, that I know, did I ever consider I would be the executive director of the Orlando Repertory Theater when I was dancing Swan Lake? Not a chance. Yeah, it wasn't on your radar. But I knew... I wanted to still be a part of performance. Still want to be a part of of surprise and delight for an audience. To touch them, touch them in the heart, to tell the mind what what to feel. That's what I really loved about children's theater. Uh, uh, I I have on my website, there's some pictures of uh, when I was uh, uh, 19, I was Sleeping Beauties, Prince, and then I go on to be with Disney on Parade, Cinderella's Prince, and then they pull me out of retirement to be Snow White's Prince. I would never cast myself as a prince. However, uh, that seemed to be somewhat of a little bit of a career for me in that role. But it's there's a magnet, and we shouldn't resist it. We'll only make ourselves unhappy, and unfortunately, we'll make a lot of other people un- unhappy as we work our way through that. Go ahead, finish that thought, because you're about to say, I think, what I was about to say. The one thing you never want to do is look back and say, I could have, should have, or might have. Uh, I've tried, and and uh, it wasn't as successful as I might have wanted, but I learned some really crucial things. But what it did was it it helped me understand that I needed to, to do some adjustments because I want to feel fulfillment. That's a big deal when I'm, I'm helping people with their career. Seek first fulfillment. My father would say, and it's an old cliche, find a job you love and never work a day in your life. My father, after he got out of the military, became a barber. He cut hair and he had his domain, his barber shop. And he had all these old dudes coming in there. They'd come in and listen to the radio back in the earlier days. And then when he got a black and white television, they loved going in there and watching ball games, camaraderie. But he treated all of them as his best friend. And for some of them, he became their best friend. I think what I've learned the most <clears throat> today from you that's just underscored, I guess what I probably always knew is, and I want everyone to think about this, especially the young folks, is you know, our purpose isn't just found in the palace. It's found in the, in the pursuit. And I think what you've de- demonstrated with your life story is, is that you're either growing or you're dying, but we're, we're always in pursuit of purpose, but it's not a destination. It's an evolution. 
And as long as you're in motion and you're using your gifts and talents and you, you, you don't have to have the answer. In fact, none of us have the answer for tomorrow. We're just taking one more step in the journey and then it's going to be the next catalyst and then the next catalyst. And the next thing you know, you're, you know, you've got a life of fulfillment because of the significance you've led through the way you've served other people. And I think that that's what I love about your life story is your pursuit of your purpose left behind a trail of people better off than what you found them, which is why you keep getting invited to retirement dinners and keep getting invited to speak and all the things that, that you're known for. At Disney, we had a training program in which uh, we had to list 10 things that described you. When it was down to one word, <clears throat> we're in this room full of, of fellow uh, entertainment uh, staff, and I was asked first, what is the one word that you would use that would best describe you? And I just said, helper. That's great. Well, speaking of being a helper, so people are wondering, how can they learn more uh, and get some more help from you? Uh, let me tell you about my, my, my dad and the, and the story that... Let's close, let's close with that story, and then we'll point people to your books and your website after that. He worked until he was 84 as a barber, he fell, broke his shoulder, even said he was going to try to cut hair with, uh, uh, with, right. with one hand. But, but leading up to it, I was trying desperately to get my dad to come to Walt Disney World. I just knew, I just knew he would just love this place. And uh, he had a little dog, a little brown dog called Peanut. And uh, Peanut was his pal. And Peanut was deaf, blind. Uh, and he said he just couldn't leave Peanut. And uh, 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 so, so he just kept putting off and putting off coming to visit. So he calls one day and says, uh, son, Peanut died. Oh, Dad, I'm so sorry. He says, well, I got another dog and I can board this one so I can come and see you. And so uh, at 75, my father took his first plane flight. He was... Uh, enamored in the Magic Kingdom. His idea of a good time uh, was the uh, uh, Crystal Palace, just off to the left. Back then they had rocking chairs and he would sit rocking and said, son, I wish there was a place like this when you and your brother and sisters were small. I could have taken you. Dad had a great time. So then for his 80th birthday, my sister and brother and I, we got together and we said, we're going to bring you to Orlando. Well, we took him out uh, to uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios, as, as it was, uh, um, I think, that before with Disney MGM Studio back then. And um, we were going down the, uh, the Sunset Boulevard. And, well, what's that? Well, what? What, that big building? That's the Tower of Terror. Can we go on it? <laughs> now, my brother and sister and I, we're not real calm. You know, this isn't, you know. So we wheel him over. Well, he had seen every run of the uh, Rod Serling Twilight Zone. And I figure we're going to get right up to the front. And he's going to say, April Fool's, and we'll go off. Well, we get up to the front, and they pull back the gate to load. He gets out of his wheelchair, and uh, my sister bolts. And then Dad and uh, uh, Dan and I, we get on it. Well, you know those pictures. Those pictures. My dad is grinning, and Dan and I are screaming. <laughs> well, we get off, and uh, we we're leaving. And uh, he said, "Oh, that was so much fun. That line wasn't that long. Can we do it again?" Uh, so, so you know, he was in a positive, wonderful, thrilling uh, mood. The next day, it was the Magic Kingdom, and it coincided with the 25th anniversary of Walt Disney World. And that's when they turned the castle into a giant pink birthday cake. Well, I take Dad in a wheelchair. He's 80 years old, and I wheel him around. We get to the top of Main Street. He looks down, and he's, oh, my God, what did they do to my castle. Oh, Dad, uh, kind of, we did it on your birthday. I don't like it. <laughs> oh, come on, Dad. It's only going to be there for, oh, a year or so. Son, 
This could be the last time I see it. Oh, stake in the heart. Get him out of here. Diversion. Take him down. Turn towards Tomorrowland. Hey, Dad, how about we get a picture with you and a character? You and Mickey Mouse. Okay. How about, I know how you are with the ladies. You and Minnie. Okay, fine. But two for the price. Chip and Dale. All right. Uh, Donald Duck. Donald Duck. Donald is hard to get, but I'll get you Donald Duck. Uh, all right. That any character. Any character? Yeah. What character? Could I get Pinocchio? Pinocchio it is. Well, I call my friends and... <laughs> In, in, in the Magic Kingdom character department. I said, can you help me out with this? And, and we go over into Fantasyland to, uh, to Pin Pinocchio Village, and there was a, an entrance, and Pinocchio comes out, and my dad's in the wheelchair. Well, he gets out of the chair, and he and Pinocchio are about the same size. And, and my father is just thrilled at that. So... Uh, we thanked everybody, and then we avoided looking at the castle and took him here or there. And then, then he was kind of tired, and so we said, let's go back to your, uh, to your hotel and, and uh, have some lunch. And my sister's a remarkable cook, and so she said she had some plans for us. So we went back, and while my uh, sister is fixing and I'm talking to Dad, uh, uh, talking about the experience, and so I say, uh, uh, Dad, b by the way, why Pinocchio, son, those were the songs that I sang to you when you were a little boy. Wow. Those, I've always known it. And then he says, particularly the one about when you wish upon a star, it makes no difference who you are. Everybody at Disney knows when I retired, Mickey didn't come up to congratulate me. It was Pinocchio. Wow. And on my lanyard, I always wore Pinocchio. I can't think of a better way to close down the episode, Gene. What an amazing story. <clears throat> what an amazing legacy your life has been to this point. And by the way, you're not even close to being done, right? You're just entering into this stage of your life when you're really adding back value to people. And so I want folks to know that are listening. Go to Gene Columbus. Dot com G E N E Columbus, just like the great city here in Ohio. Dot com. Get his books, Leadership Lessons Learned, Being Next to Goofy, which could have been titled My Wife uh, if she wrote a book, <laughs> <laughs> uh, as well as his The Complete Guide to Careers and Special Events. Gene's a great uh, public speaker. He goes out and does a lot of keynote speaking. He does one on one coaching. He's got courses. Uh, it's It's rare to have someone with his experience make his wisdom available to the masses. And Gene, you're doing that. And I not only commend you, I thank you for it. And thank you for being a guest on the show. And I, I can't wait to keep following you and seeing what you're up to next. I know our listeners are going to get a ton out of this episode and out of connecting with you. So thank you. Jeff, thank you. And if we take any one thing away from this conversation, make someone feel important. And Jeff, you have. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. It's been my honor.